this is going to be easy to follow, but difficult to remember. So just follow it, and I will reweave the elements and bring it to a pattern in the second tab. So don't stop your flow because you're trying to already remember so you don't forget what's going on. Now notice here in this caution that there are two contradictory invitations. One is to participate in what is going on and the other is to not participate in something that is going to come up in what is going on. You're being asked to participate in a flow, and yet we know from experience that part of that particular flow is that we begin to get the suspicion that we're losing track of it, and therefore we want to try and remember it to save it, and that's going to take us out of the flow. All right, let's say it one more time. Let's say it even simpler. We're being asked to be in a flow, and part of that flow is that we're going to be taken out of the flow by something that's totally natural to that flow. The longer that flow goes on, the more will be the temptation to try and remember what's going on by temporarily taking ourselves out of the flow to take note of it, and so the flow itself has a kind of a thorn in it. And in fact, this is the whole purpose of the symbol of a vine, which if you follow the vine to the fruit, then you will have the fruition of the flow. But at the same time, the vine can contain thorns, and the farther you go along that particular vine, the more the thorns are going to get you, and you're going to become lacerated. Rather than having fruit, you're going to end up injured. It's the same metaphor. So when you look at, for instance, the earliest catacomb art on Christianity in Rome, you don't find any crosses at all. You don't find a single cross. You always find grapes. Because grapes are on a kind of a vine that doesn't have thorns, but has fruit. So it's a kind of a flow that if you just go with it, it will have a fruition. But there is an intermediary in between the thorn bush and the grape, the thorn vine and the grape vine. The intermediary, a kind of a third flow, is the rose. The rose has thorns, but it also has a fantastic blossom. The fruit of which is a very special kind of a fruit. So that the symbol for the deep self that holds, the symbol for the self that holds, is that of the rose, not of the grape, or of the thorn, or of the vine, but of the rose. Because achieving one's own self is a process which has to take in both the thorns and the flow at the same time both at the same time. It has to take two contradictory, paradoxical happenings at the same time. So that the achievement of the interior rose is always the weathering of a paradoxical flow. And the archetypal paradox of that particular kind of a flow is that it always seeks to interrupt itself not from something outside, 
which is against the flow, but from the flow itself, something natural to the flow itself. So there's no way to be in the flow and not have this resistance to staying in the flow prop up naturally. When we talk about the qualities of character necessary to meet these specifications, the classic way to talk about those attributes of character were constancy and restraint. Because constancy and restraint are in a very real way in the practical world contradictory. To have constancy and yet to have restraint is to engage in contradictory behavior. In order to clarify for ourselves, we need to go back, as we've gone back several times, to a classic language, an ancient language. I tend to go back to classical Greek because it's the first way that I learned. I didn't know the Sanskrit terms. I didn't know the Egyptian terms. I learned it first from knowing the Greek terms. And the Greek terms are dynamis and energia. In order to have constancy, one has to have dynamics. You have to have that kind of psychic power that has a dynamic to it. Even in engineering texts, one talks about thermodynamics, hydrodynamics, the flow of heat the flow of water. Even in engineering mathematical analysis is a constancy that has a dynamic to it. It has a dynamics. And that that is directly opposite. It is polar opposite to restraint. Restraint is an impedance. It stops the dynamic. There is no way to have constancy with giving in to resistance. And yet, the resistance comes as a natural part of the dynamics. How natural is it? Because the other term, energia, we get our term energy from that the term energia. And yet it is distinctly different. When Thucydides writes about the power of the state, he uses the term dynamics. The state has power. But when he writes about the individual, the individual's power is an energia. And the whole problem between the state and the individual is a problem inherent in development, not because God is an evil genie trying to muck us up, not because the, there's a, some devil who's really good and got his hooks in the man really good, but because in the nature of development, this always happens. It has to happen. It's natural to it to happen. And so a real wisdom tradition knows this and puts this, weaves this into it's fundamental myths. And so now in the myth section, we come to the book of Daniel from the Old Testament and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, an Arthurian poem from the time of Chaucer. And we're pairing these two together because they have a peculiar kind of relationality. They illuminate for us because they are both exquisite works of human excellence. 
We don't know the author of either work. Both works are anonymous. My researches have shown that the author of the book of Daniel is the teacher of righteousness, the founder of the Qumran Essene community about 160 BC on the shores of the Dead Sea. In fact, the earliest manuscript copies of fragments of the book of Daniel come from Qumran. If we come here to um, this uh, Anchor Bible, Book of Daniel. The Anchor Bible is uh, one of the great translations of the book of, of, the, of the Bible. It will be in 66 volumes when it's completed. There's about 55 volumes completed already. The Book of Daniel, page 72 of the introduction. The oldest manuscript fragments of the Book of Daniel were discovered in caves 1, 4, and 6 at Quanran for very good reason. Because the book of Daniel was the workbook for the original founding of the Essene community. Meant to allow for a constancy of addressing the full spectrum of man's capability and not just a cribbed, smaller, forced spectrum given to you by authority, by the state. Because the state at that time was no longer the state that was there in terms of the return from the exile, Ezra Nehemiah reforms, but the Neo-Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar had devolved through the Persian king Cyrus the Great and his uh, ancestors Darius and after about three or four hundred years had finally decayed to a Hellenistic kingdom in what had been the Neo-Babylonian area, what had been the Persian Empire and now was just a Hellenistic kingdom run by an egomaniac named Antiochus IV, who took great pride in going into Jerusalem and say, we're all going to believe in the Hellenistic religion, which is the foundation of this Hellenistic kingdom. You're going to believe in the religion of the state. And therefore a statue of Zeus was put in the high temple and if you believed that this was Yahweh's house, you were killed. Everyone was made to swear an oath. And the high priest of the Judaism of the time became the top salesman for this new Hellenistic state religion. And so it was a problem between the state and the individual, the teacher of righteousness, said, I can't do this. I know God. I have a direct link with God. I can't do this. And so the Essene community was set up on the shores of the Dead Sea by the teacher of righteousness. As it says in their documents that we find from the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is a remnant left over a remnant that the whole fabric <laughs> Jewish life has been completely shattered, shredded, junked, tarnished, thrown away. Because a Hellenistic state religion has said, this must be so. That's how it always happens. The Third Reich in Germany said the very same thing. Stalinist Russia said the very same thing. You're not Ukrainians, you're not Lithuanians, you're Soviets. And you'll obey the laws of the state. The Roman Empire said the same thing. 
It's extremely important, and I'm weaving this back again, it's extremely important to realize that these kinds of monstrous binds, these kinds of knots, develop not because something has gone wrong, but because something is just simply happening the way it really does. But it takes an enormous amount of concentration and intelligence to understand not only what is really happening, but how to deal with it. Because you cannot deal with it by simply abstracting yourself away from it. Because the Essene community, which successfully, after three or four generations of struggle, abstracted themselves away from it, the more that they abstracted themselves away from the situation, the more they became caught up in the polarities themselves and became fanatics for a kind of a purity which engendered its own kind of resistances. So much so that it's absolutely foolish to think that Jesus was in the scene. Because the Essenes by that time had become apocalyptic believers that only some really big time fire falling from the sky with only a specific pattern of people saved, 144,000, that's it. That's it! So that when you look at the book of Revelation, which was written largely by John the Baptist and edited by St. John, you see the culmination of an Essene vision of what's got to happen. They have got to be boiled in oil to hell with forgiveness. This has got to be. It's got to be ripped. It's got to be shredded. Notice here that the very process that happens, if you allow for yourself to be caught up in the polarities, you are doomed. Maybe not you, but eventually that ends into dead ends. You're heading for box canyon. One never even gets a chance to be in the kind of paradoxical flow that yields roses. And you don't get the grapes. And you really don't get the thorns. Everyone has enough togetherness to keep from getting snagged on the thorns. After you're 30 years old, you know enough about the world, you stay away from stuff. But avoiding engenders in itself a subliminal desire to not deal with the resistances, which means that you're not in the flow because the resistances are there as a natural part. And mathematics is called a recursive. It's a recursive part of that flow. It has to be there. There are good signs. If the demons are not good demons, they're not causing you any trouble. One of the great little wisdom stories from the Byzantine Empire, which had some very clever people because they dealt with a, a, a very peculiar kind of metaphysical version of the Roman Empire. Simon Stolites, who spent 40 years on top of a pillar in great penance, to teach the body humility. And he developed a, a kind of a fester, a sore. And actually maggots began to breed in this sore on his leg. And one of them fell out onto the platform on top of this pillar and he picked it up and put it back on the sore. And he said, eat the food God has given. Hey, the resistances have to be there. Anesthetizing yourself out of the resistances is, is not going to get it done. 
so that all of the tranquilizers, all of the sugar-coated placebos, give us a sense of false realm so that we never have the courage to live. And it's not just the lesson absorbed of the Greek, and it's not just a lesson, it is the direct basic insight of human beings who refuse to be compromised, who recognize that the resistances, when they're really good, are a sign that the flow is engendering good thorns. These are good, healthy thorns. But the whole issue is not to be some kind of Simon Stelites and keep shredding yourself on those thorns, but to understand that there's something going on here that requires a transformation. And so this section of the myth, this next month, is all about how those polarities are transformed into complementarities. And that you can get to the rose by dealing with the thorns in the right way. One of the great little fairy tales, Rose Queen, is about the rose princess who falls asleep because she's unloved. And when she falls asleep, the entire court falls asleep. The horses fall asleep, the chickens fall asleep, <laughs> the old maid falls asleep, the gendarmes in the castle fall asleep, everyone is asleep, and this rose bush, this colossal cosmic rose bush grows so wild that everything becomes enveloped in a cloud of thorns, and no one can get through, and the only way, the only way that all of this can be dissipated is that that sleeping princess must be kissed by someone who truly loves her. Let's stop here for just a second. Let's just set the flower down. Let's just sit down and find, come in, come in. We're starting at 10 and that's it. I wish there were somebody else to talk about it. I'd love to do something else myself, but there isn't. Okay, let's come back. In our way of looking at myth, we have come through a kind of a reference, a reference which had as a basic polarity, male, female, men, women, a man, a woman. It's a polarity which is there because of life's flow. That's what's there. It isn't there as a sociological construct. It's not there as some kind of ideational artifact. It's not there because of some kind of false characterization. It's there in the life process. Sexuality is a part of a life process, organic life process. Sexual differentiation happens on the molecular level long before there are any kind of opinions by sentient creatures as complex as we are. The cells are male or female. The cells on the molecular level it's part of the life process because that polarity is necessary to engender the dynamic that's necessary for constancy. So in an Arthurian myth like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, the constancy has everything to do with sexuality. Not because he's horny, not because he's noble, but because he is real. And when the issue of constancy is 
part of the life process that is real, the issue, the polar issue of restraint is going to come up. It has to come up. And the restraint is going to be a resistance to the constancy. One would like to be clever and say, well, one is going to be consistently restrained. That's very cute. Or you're going to be restrained constantly. Someone who is restrained constantly, like a monk, doesn't deal with that life energy. Abstracts themselves away from it. And yes, you can do that. And you can cement yourself in so that you're, you wouldn't even be tempted by seeing a beautiful child or a beautiful flower. Simon Stelites could do that. He wasn't turned off by the maggots falling out of his wounds at all. He just put them back in. Eat the food God has given you. So constant restraint is not it. And restrained constancy is not it either. They have to be transformed. Because as long as they're in this polar quality, one gets the dynamic necessary for life. But only through transforming them into a complementation does one get the energia that is also necessary. So that reality needs both together, and you can't throw either one away. Now, we've talked for a few minutes about the book of Daniel. When you open the book of Daniel, when you look at the way the book of Daniel begins, it begins here in the third year of the reign of Josiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came and besieged Jerusalem. So that the book of Daniel begins with the siege of Jerusalem. And when you open Sir Gawain in the Green Knight, it begins the siege and the assault being ceased at Troy. So it begins with the siege of Troy. Both books begin with the siege of a city. A central symbolic city. One is the siege of Troy, the other is the siege of Jerusalem. We've got two books here that we're using as a pair. As a pair, because when you have a pair, you can have a tuning fork if they're struck together. And if you have a tuning fork, you can hear the pitch at which you can tune your psyche to wholeness. Otherwise, who knows? You have to have a mode. You cannot tune without a mode. Without a mode, there's only infinite sound. Yes, there is infinite sound. Tune it. And you can integrate it. If you don't tune it, there's no way. Because there's no calibration. All you're dealing with are more zeros powers. People are stymied with one zero, much less an infinite bushel basket full of zeros. So you have to have a mode. It's like in sound, as soon as you have a musical mode, then you can have not only rhythm and syncopation and a melodic line, but you can begin to change speech into poetry. And a language which becomes poetic is able to deal with the paradoxes of transformation and bring polarities into a real working pattern. This is wisdom. It has nothing to do with weekends in Acapulco. Or a Vedic real estate. I'm sorry, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with being direct, honest, plain, forthright about what is real. The life process 
must have a flow, it must have a dynamic, and its choice is a mode of flow that deals with sexuality on the organic level. That's how it is. It's not sociological, it's not historical, it's not ideational. It's what happens in the biomathematics of that particular flow. And we happen to be extant in that flow. That's the mode, that's the musical tone. We are smart then when we recognize that this is what's going on. And somehow we're a melody in that mode. And we would like to know, with all honesty, how can I hum my own tune? Because I can learn that mode well enough, and I can use something called imagination, which comes into play, and I can learn my own melody. And if I know my melody, and I know how I got to have my melody, I can hear someone else's melody, other people's melodies, and I can find those melodies that go with mine. And it turns out that there is a fantastic quality of integration that's able to happen when people sing they, their selves in the same way. So that one of the cinches of a tribe, of a family, of a culture, is that its people sing the same way. It's called a choir. And the ultimate image of a choir is that, in the Western world at least, is that in heaven, what do the angels do? They sing together. Now, the ultimate image of that is from Dante from the Paradiso, the third part of the Divine Comedy. God is surrounded by the angels, the angelic choirs that are arranged as a transcendental rose. It's amazing how simple it is, but one has to understand that the simplicity is elusive because as soon as you have remembered it, you have abstracted it out of the flow that you are in. You've stopped humming your melody, and you have become a victim of resistance. You're already being buried. Because the penalty is that if one is not in the flow of life, one is either abstracted up off the ground, or one is buried underneath the ground, consigned to the netherworld, to the underworld. We're going to get to them pretty soon, the Vestal Virgins in Rome. This is an old book, it's hard to find this around. This is the History of the Vestal Virgins of Rome, published uh, Paternoster Row, the Occult Section of London, 1934. The discipline of the Vestals, in view of the high reverence with which the Vestal virgins were regarded in the religious life of Rome, it is natural to find that the penalties imposed on those who were careless in the performance of their duties or unfaithful to their vows of chastity should have been extremely severe. They were buried alive. When Plotinus in the third century AD was running a school just like this out of his own home in Rome, and his students were, there were just about 50 or 60 students. It's true that the Emperor Aurelian and his wife were among them and about uh, a dozen Roman senators and uh, many distinguished uh, people, doctors and so forth. But nevertheless, it wasn't very large at all. There were not huge crowds. There are never crowds. He had a visitor from Alexandria, a mystical 
psychic genius from Alexandria who wanted to see if Plotinus's guardian spirit was um, uh, powerful. And so in order to conjure up Plotinus's guardian spirit, they had to find sacred ground in Rome. And they found that there was only one spot in the entire two million population city of Rome that was still pure, and that was the Temple of Vesta, where the Vestal Virgins were. <coughs> they conjured up his guardian spirit, and uh, the Alexandrian Bacchus was astounded, as was everyone else who was present, because Plotinus's guardian spirit was God. The Vestal Virgins were directly related to, directly related to, the Pontifex Maximus. The Pontifex Maximus was like the Apollo to the Vestal Virgins as muses. They went together. And that institution went back to King Numa and the foundations of Rome, 753 B.C. So that that ground, by Plotinus's time, had been kept pure for over a thousand years. What was in the Temple of Vesta was a sacred fire. A sacred fire that they tended. It never went out. It had burned for a thousand years by the time of Plotinus. It had never gone out. Because the fire, the sacred fire, is the symbol of the transforming capacity. Fire transforms. It's the way in which polarities are brought into not a juxtaposition, but an interpenetration which changes their form. Clever juxtapositions do not do it. There are just so many clever variants on polarity. And all you do is you engender rarer and rarer viruses of resistance. Really nasty ones. Slimers. Real nasty ones. So that our time is filled with some of the most arcane, deadly, psychic viruses ever engendered on any planet is a real mess. A doctor of civilization can hardly bear to listen to the stethoscope. So that the deep archetypal need is for some kind of apocalyptic fire to purify it. And that's exactly what's wrong. That would just be giving in to the resistances in big time way. Whereas the transformating, transformational fire, the apocalyptic fire, put into a restrained form, like the exhaust of a rocket ship, a spaceship, is exactly what's needed. Somebody once, in a celebration in Germany, some science fiction convention, put a great big huge... Uh, cut out construct about 30 stories high of a spaceship next to a gothic cathedral and then somebody took a photograph of that and it's instantly to someone who has a wisdom eye you can see that's it it's not stone that is rearranged to cleverly give the feeling of transcendence here but it's metal arranged so that it does transcend because it lifts on a pillar of fire and carries with it everything direct to the rose. So that restraint and constancy go together. Even though they're polarities, they do go together. And in something like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight or the Book of Daniel, the knack of wisdom is to understand how that happens. How do constancy and restraint interpenetrate in such a way that they transform the whole of the life that is in its individual mode singing the song? So that Gawain and Daniel are heroic in that they understand how to do this. 
And both of them have to go through a certain kind of a fire. In the book of Daniel, there's this huge furnace room for people that do not do the correct occult bidding of Nebuchadnezzar. And in fact, Daniel has three friends that are thrown into this furnace. Their Jewish names are not remembered except in the book of Daniel. Most children in the United States remembered as Meshach, uh, Shadrach, and Abednego, who do not get burnt up by the fire. And when the other competing wizards of Nebuchadnezzar's court look in, they see the three companions of Daniel still there, but that there's a fourth person there with them, who has white woolly hair and eyes like jewels and a complexion like burnished brass looking out at them. That same figure comes in the book of Revelation some 200 years later. The very same figure is there. So that when one looks at very deep prophetic works all the way through, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are always held together. But how they go together and why they go together, no one knows. Sir Isaac Asimov spent the last 30 years of his life, he was a genius, trying to figure out, Daniel and the book of Revelation, how those symbols went together. And he was a masterful ma mathematical mind. There's nothing second rate about Sir Isaac Newton. Don't throw him away. He was a first class mathematician. He understood integration. He understood calculus. But that is a paradoxical integration and beyond the capacity of Newton to understand. Whereas someone like Niels Bohr understood it, and when he did, it was a completely new mathematics. One that had a kind of a differential geometry that develops into gauge theories and is able to take all kinds of things, all kinds of paradoxes that are completely beyond imagination, completely and yet so real that when people now integrate their individuality, you can do it on a scale of the entire cosmos. You want to be a universal person? You can. But you got to give up this kind of foolish playpen activity and get to work. Let's take a break. Let's come back. Let's bring ourselves back Let's come back to our focus. We have an ongoing flow, which is our education. And that education, as a flow, is going to engender resistances. It should engender resistances, because it's an effective flow. In fact, our entire sense of current is the ratio between the flow and the impedance. Otherwise, you don't have a sense of, of the uh, voltage. You don't have a sense of the current. So in a very paradoxical way, our whole ability to feel the real is based upon the ratio of the flow to the resistance. And if you weed out the resistance, you do not have a real sense of the voltage of life. And so you have to make one up by imagination, and that's what causes neuroses. And neuroses is an imaginary resistance. Necessary, because otherwise one doesn't feel anything. And the cure for the neurotic condition is to have real resistances so you don't have to imagine resistances. Because the only way to deal with imagined resistances effectively is to get rid of the imagination. And that takes a very powerful yoga, that takes a long time to learn, and when you do, 
you're gone. You don't get to go grocery shopping. You don't even have the need. So that's not really, really a viable path. You can take it if you want. That is a four-lane superhighway. If you want to learn that yoga, I'll give you the references. I'll show you how to do that. And you can go and do that, and you can exit. But that's not it. And just making adjustments in a neurotic way of having more clever and more up-to-date and more pizzazzy neurotic conditions is foolishness. So our education has real resistances because they're necessary. But the real resistances are actually, when one looks at their occurrence, they are forms of restraint. They are forms of restraint. And part of the beauty of aesthetics, if I can be a little punish here, part of the beauty of aesthetics is that one can come to understand form. And the forms of language are particularly the archetypal forms by which r resistance becomes restraint, becomes able to be ratioed with the flow. So that language as a medium, the medium of language, is extremely important because the forms of language are the etiology of restraint. So that in the classic age, when human beings, men and women, were first dealing consciously with these issues, about 2,400 years ago, really consciously dealing with these issues, the individual versus the state, the restraint versus the constancy, men consciously versus women consciously. In order for all of those polarities to come into creative wholeness, into complementation, there had to be a transformation which had to do with the way that the forms of language change. And so when we come to understand myth, which is to say the intelligence of feeling, it all has to do with language and its forms. So that this whole part of our education is centered around this kind of issue. Not only the content, the myths, but the pattern which all those myths make together, the mythology, and the very medium by which those myths, by which that mythology comes to be told, language. And the very faculty that we have, called feeling, which makes that language operative and allows for the forms of language to be participatory in the transformation process. One of the curious things that we are discovering about language is that language interiorizes the world. Things, this here flower, becomes an image of that flower through my languaging. And when I can language and make an image of that flower, I can see the image in my mind, in my imagination. Now we're going to make a great difference later on that imagination is not the whole mind, it's just a faculty of the mind. In fact, it's an integral faculty of the mind. It has a complementation all of its own in memory, that memory and imagination are 
and to learn to deal with them both creatively together in a whole this takes a lot of sophistication. But right now we're just talking about how the image is the interiorization of the world through language. And anyone who has been daydreaming on a freeway knows that the image can completely take over your attention and you forget about what's happening. And you can't daydream too much at 90 miles an hour or whatever the speed limit is now. <laughs> Especially if you're at Indianapolis at 200 miles an hour, or on the Audubon going uh, 200 miles an hour, and to Frankfurt, you, you've got to watch yourself because uh, if you daydream too much, you could you could miss the traffic situation. You can, when you're safely parked, uh, sit behind the wheel and imagine to yourself being somewhere else, and you can do that strong enough that you are there and not behind the wheel. That is to say, your feeling responses are there and not where you are in terms of the world. And we call this a daydream, a daydream, which is a version of dreaming, so that dreaming is an interior imagery that can interiorize the world to such an extent that dreams can for all their energia displace the waking world. And one of the big concerns in the history of conscious beings is always how to understand dreams. What's going on? What do dreams mean? And that's what the book of Daniel, for instance, is all about. What do dreams mean? But if you're troubled by a really big dream, by a dream that is so powerful that when you wake up, its feeling tone is still with you and you can't shake it. So that you have got to know what that means. Then you're in a similar condition to Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. This autocratic king who thinks that state power, and because he runs state power, is all powerful and yet he has a dream. And he has a dream that unsettles him so much that he is literally almost crumbling. But one of the requirements of an authoritarian state-based power is that it has to be exact. It has to know exactly. It has to test and make sure that it has the right answers, the right interpretation. And so like in the book of Daniel, it says, all of the court magicians of Nebuchadnezzar were unable to interpret his dream. And someone mentioned that he had a man in his employ, a very talented man named Daniel, one of the Jews brought over from the capture out of Jerusalem, and that he was the best dream interpreter that there was. But the court magicians didn't want Daniel to really be successful. So they said to Nebuchadnezzar, well, look, test him. If he's so good, don't tell him the dream. Make him know what the dream was, and that way he'll know that his interpretation was right. So Nebuchadnezzar called in Daniel. He said, I want you to interpret my dream. Daniel said, well, what is the dream? He said, well, that's up to you to find out. That's how I know that your interpretation is accurate. So he's given an impossible problem. There's no way, except that if you're like Daniel and you know how to work with polarities and transform them, he went from the very resistance 
characterized by Nebuchadnezzar being so fearful that he wouldn't even tell the dream, that Daniel saw in his imagination the resolution of the dream image that Nebuchadnezzar had. Because if you can work from wholeness, you can work either backwards from that wholeness or forwards to it. It doesn't make any difference. The analytical process goes both ways. It's quite easy. And so by taking an accurate image of Nebuchadnezzar's resistance, Daniel not only recovered the dream, but found, because he undid the thing backwards, he knew exactly what the meaning was. Here's the image. To you, O king, as you were lying on your bed, thoughts came about that would happen hereafter, and the revealer of mysteries has shown you what will happen. To me, however, this mystery has been revealed, not because my own wisdom is more than that of other living persons, see, he's covering himself, but in order that its meaning may be shown to you, and thus you may understand the thought that came to your heart. In your vision, O king, you beheld standing before you a statue that was very large and extraordinary in appearance. The sight of it was terrifying. The head of the statue was of pure gold. Its arms and chest were of silver, its belly and hips of bronze, the legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of terracotta clay. This is where the phrase feet of clay comes from, from the book of Daniel. Lo and behold, as I used to say. As you looked on, a stone was cut out without a hand being put to it, and striking the statue on its feet of clay, it crushed the feet, and the entire statue fell. <clears throat> that you can have a gold head, you can have silver chest, you can have the bronze hips, you can have the iron legs, but if your feet are of clay, you are precarious, you are fragile. One stone could topple you. Shades of King David. One stone thrown at the right place will topple an empire. It's like a archetypal karate. If you know where the fragility is, there's no problem. It doesn't matter how powerful. They can have stock portfolios that fill semi-trucks. It doesn't make a bit of difference. It's like in the day the Earth stood still. All that the uh, spaceship visitor had to do was to just make sure that electricity didn't work. By taking out the magnetic component of electromagnetism, it just simply went away. Hence the day the Earth stood still. So that if you understand how things work, the structure, you can not only make them work, but you can undo something that's not working right without exercising a lot of power. You just have to put your finger in the right place. And it doesn't take much of a touch at all. Worldly power is pretty fragile. That's why it's pathetic to count on pathos. Daniel interprets not only the dream, but he interprets the larger resonances of that dream. And the book of Daniel, being in a scene dream manual, taught the people how to use this, not only to interpret their dreams, and not only how to interpret other people's dreams, but how to enlarge the resonances of dream interpretation so that they take, finally, stock of world-class, into-the-age visions. Because those visions only come once 
It's like for an individual who's healthy, whole, whose psyche is in a vibrant working reality. Just before death, you will have a death dream. It's a characteristic part of a wholesome human life. You have a death dream. When my spirit mother had her death dream, she was driven to a hospital. She was very old. And when she was taken into the hospital, in the lobby way, there was this cacophony of wailing baby sounds, and there was this baby wretchedly crying and more and more. And there was this whole cluster of doctors off to one side, not paying any attention at all to this rasping, choking, colic, crying baby. And she was so incensed by this that she went up and she tapped one of the doctors to, to say, you know, why don't one of you take care of this baby? And immediately, the doctor figure, this death dream, turned around and had two eggs in his hands. He crushed them and put them on her glasses. So she had egg yolks on her glasses. And they said, you don't have to be here in this hospital. You can go home. And she said, but I, I can't drive. I can't see. They said, well, we'll, we'll drive you home. And they drove her. And they pulled up in front of this huge, beautiful place, and she said, but I, I don't live here. I live in a little honey house with lilac bushes and cr crickety steps. They said, no, this is, this is where you live. And she, with trepidation, able to see somehow around and through the eggs on her glasses, went to the front door, and then with tremulous knock, the door opened, and there was her husband, Ross, who'd been dead for a couple of years, but instead of being nearly 90, he had his slick black hair, how he was when she met him and fell in love with him. He said, welcome home. She went in. One will always have a correct image in the imagination of anything that is real because it characterizes the resistance. It has to. Not the constancy, but the resistance. Dream images are natural, resistant images. And they're the keys, they're the cues to forms of language. Otherwise, language would just be a flow. A language without any resistances is a language that just flows in a kind of, well, the classic term is from the Gospel according to Luke. The descent of the Holy Spirit and Pentecost, where everyone spoke in tongues. It's called glossolalia, because there are no forms to the language. And one can understand any language instantly, once. But unless one is in that flow completely, there's nothing to say. It's just universal background. Like the black body energy at three degrees Kelvin. It's just it's everywhere all the time. But it has no form. No form at all. The resistance are useful because they make the images calibrate the mode so that forms are there, so that expressivity can happen. That's why they're there. And to erase them by drugs or replace them by cleverness because of uh, two-bit uh, uh, gen teachers posing as Taoists or whatever you have, is extraneous. That's putting it gently. It's just simply extraneous. It has nothing to do with anything useless. So that when we look at our education, and we look at the pattern of our education, and we're at the third section of eight sections. The first section was nature, the second was ritual, and now the third is myth. And we look at myth, we see that 
myth deals with the shapes and forms that language has in order to tell us what's going on, tells us the stories. And the shape of that story is specific and cued, always cued, by the resistances. And if we pay attention to the resistances and interiorize them into accurate images, then we can understand. Because we have to put those resistance images into ratio with the flow. The resistances are always going to be the numerators, and the flow is always going to be the denominator. And the taking of polarities and bringing them into ratios is the way in which transformation happens. That's, what, that's how it happens. Once this is understood, then one can go to work in a very big way. Now we looked at Inanna, Queen of Heaven, at the myths of the Cimmerian celestial goddess, and paired with Plato's Phaedrus, in which there were myths of how language came to be. Myths of the chariot of the soul, and many other things. And we paired them together and we talked about them for a month. This week, is the first of four weeks that we're putting in on Daniel and Sir Gwen and the Great Knight. One book which deals with dreams coming into visions. And the other book dealing with visions that come out of myths. Sir Gwen and the Green Knight is about how a vision of universal wholeness comes out of myths. And the book of Daniel is how a vision of universal homeless goes out of dreams. And they both begin. They both begin. It's incredible. They both begin with sieges of a sacred city. Because a successful siege requires constancy and restraint together. So, the teacher of righteousness is the author of the book of Daniel. It's no wonder that he also authored the book of Job. It turns out to be one of the greatest writers in world history. Because the book of Job is all about the siege of the individual. By the saint. One always uses the article the because of the sexuality of Satan is neuter. Neither male nor female. The devil's not a man. The devil is specifically a neuter and doesn't give a damn about either men or women. So what the neutered person of the Satan likes is inorganic chemistry. Stone, man. Stone. Dead stone, good. Burnt out cinder asteroids, wonderful words. So that the whole image of hell is that it is a place that is refining itself into a burnt out cinder. That's why it's on fire. So when the Satan was pictured in illuminated manuscripts by the early Irish saints who spoke Greek and not Celtic, by the way. They were the only people in Europe at that time who spoke the classical Greek. They got their images. They put in the side of the manuscripts. You can see like a page out of the Book of Kells where you have the devil. The devil is not some robust red figure with a pitchfork and a <coughs> snazzy outfit is a burnt out stick figure, a match figure of something which is outside the margin of the language. Something that's outside, out 
outside the void, the abyss outside of the flow of life, of life's language, of polarities becoming transformational wholes. So that one needs to understand, for instance, we were talking earlier about sexuality not being a sociological construct, yet not being an ideational artifact, that it happens on the cellular level, the molecular level. It's a book published in Berlin a few years ago, The Molecular Basis of Sex and Differentiation. When one gets down to the structure, then the way in which the flow happens becomes almost like a visionary who, the classic visionary statement in the Western tradition was always the one that Robert Grosetesti gave to his student, Roger Bacon. They were at uh, Oxford to University when it first started. It opened its doors uh, around, uh, I think it was around uh, 1240 or so, about 700 years before I was born. Grosetesti means great head. Well, Robert Grosetesti told the young genius Roger Bacon, he said, when you look at a rainbow, every drop of water in that rainbow rainbow is in itself a rainbow. There's an esoteric way of talking truth. So that when you are able to see in your mind a rainbow raindrop, you will be able to know that you can see the real. And you are ready then for transformation. As long as you still see raindrops distributed in the rainbow, that some are red, some are green, some are blue, you're not ready for transformation. Keep refining. When you see the single rainbow raindrop, that's it. Then you have the maturity of interior to ratio the real. Then you're ready for alchemy then you're ready to transmute. Otherwise, you're in a process that your imagination can be pure gold in your feet of clay. And you have no way to defend yourself against somebody who comes in after you with simple stone. A stone is being a drop of evil. Metaphor. So our whole concern now for, the, for this week and the following three weeks is to somehow understand that myths and dreams which share a language mode, which share a process of interiorization, which share ways in which images come to not just represent the world, Initially, it's thought that they just represent the world. But they change in such a way that when you integrate the images, you can take that integration and project it back out on the world and change the world. That's the whole basis of projection in alchemy. When you make the philosopher's gold, the test of that gold is not on some assay thing to make sure that it's real gold, but whether it has a projective capacity. If you look, if you actually read alchemical texts, and not just hear about them fourth hand from somebody who thought they read Carl Jung, the test of alchemical gold is its projective capacity whether it can project a thousand times, or five thousand times, or fifty million times. And real eternal goal 
can project infinitely. So there is a quality here that's that's not only been left out of popular culture, it's not even in the so-called teachers of popular cultures, that not even because they don't read. They don't go firsthand, not just in, in reading, but in reading themselves. Yeah, it's a blanket condemnation. It sure is. Our educational process depends right now on understanding that the interiorization that happens here is the blending together of two qualities that go together. One is dynamis, the other is energeia. Constancy and restraint in terms of, of Sir Gwen and the Green Knight. In terms of the high medieval mythos, constancy and restraint. We're bringing them together in such a way that they interpenetrate and they form, they form the symbol, the vehicle by which prayer is projected. The praying hands or the polarities brought together to allow for a resonant projection to change the structure of the world. To think that the hands brought together like this are a prayer hoping that you're going to get something is a complete misunderstanding. The power of prayer is to give wholeness. To give, not to get. And to give wholeness, not to get things. So if you're all chanting to get that new, what kind of car is in now? Infinity. That's even beautiful. If you're chanting to get your Q45, you're a neurotic Santa. <laughs> and you're running up the stroke total. <laughs> and you're exceeding the handicap a lot. Yeah, it's time to cash in. This mythic section is a counter movement to the first four weeks. This second four weeks is a counter movement to the first four weeks. If you look at the educational program, You'll see that it's structured out. Every quarter, every season has the same thing. It has a three part structure. Here in nature, we started off with the movement, then the counter movement, then the stand. The same thing in ritual, the same thing here in myth. Movement, counter movement, stand. It's a universal process. If you take a starting point, a genesis point, and you rotate that movement around 359 degrees and do not close that circle, but reverse feel and make a counter movement 359 degrees, what you have done is you have left the initial point free. If you close the circle, you're in a neurotic tape loop. It doesn't matter how grand that circle. It doesn't make any difference at all. To put it in a more blunt, popular way, you're just blowing soap bubbles. And most educations literally are teaching people to live within um, bubble existences so that they're not much good once those bubbles burst. That's why the common, ordinary people scoff at education. It just makes people believe in fragile, make-believe realms that don't have anything to do with the real struggle of life. And so they say of people like that, well, they're just intellectuals. But to throw away intelligence is to commit suicide. The time-honored thing was to make sure that you do not close the circle, but the closer that you come to closing it and yet not close it, and reverse field makes a tremendous dynamic.
a tremendous dynamics comes out of that. So that when you bring it back around, and instead of closing it then, but you allow it to hold its own, the initial point is sandwiched in between, almost like in parentheses, of openness. And so that the function of the double movement is to emphasize that the beginning is still intact, still pristine, not at all touched. And we know now, for instance, from um, chaos theory in the 1990s, that once you know accurately the beginning point of any process, even if the process were random, it will still generate a form. And that, in fact, if there is a double attractor, like the two openness, they're called Lorenz attractors, that particular gravity of happening will always find a universal form that looks very much like the wings of a butterfly looks like the two parts of an infinity sign. And the Greek term psyche was the term for the image of the butterfly. One's entire form of psychic energy was the psyche. Sir James George Fraser, one of, the, one of our figures that we use from time to time, we used his golden bow, had this beautiful series of lectures published in 1913, Psyche's Task, a Discourse Concerning the Influence of Superstition on the Growth of Institutions, Psyche's Task. And one of Psyche's Task is not only to individualize itself, to integrate itself so that the butterfly of our psyche is free, but to be free in a world where there are flowers so it can live. And those institutions, those social institutions, if they're not made into flowers, if they're made into stone-cold prisons, you can have individuated in the best of ways and you will suffocate because the world will be inhospitable to wholeness. So that both of them have to go together. And to simply use yogic techniques to sophisticatedly abstract oneself from all the problems still leaves the world in problems and the only place you can live is uh, in transcendental realms. And it's not that the rent is going up in transcendental realms and it's not that they're crowded but it just doesn't do anything to help life. And life being a very precious being would like to have some help. is tired of gasping for air. So this whole process in looking at myth is not just to learn about myths, but to actively participate in a kind of a strategic motion and movement, a double movement, that will allow for the third week, the third month rather, the third section, to come in and be a section which characterizes not only the starting point, but the summation of the first and second sections as parentheses, emphasizing the freedom of that starting point. And every one of the eight sections that we take in our education uses the same format. So that after doing this eight times, and you don't have to be conscious about it, you don't have to be intellectual about it, it's like someone learning to ride a bicycle. All you have to do is do it. There's no way that you could talk about the kinetic balance necessary to ride a bicycle in terms of biomathematics. You don't, there are very few people that can do that. But almost anyone can learn to ride the bike by, by doing it. And once you've learned to ride a bike, you never forget it. Once wholeness is learned, one never forgets it. 
It's your choice whether you use it. But it's there to use instantly at any time. And that's what this is all about. It requires, though, that you participate. If you don't participate, nothing happens. Try to get yourself circling in the green day. Try to get yourself a copy of the book of Daniel. Any Bible will do. I like the Anchor Bible version because it's, it's interesting. Start both of them. Read as far as your attention allows you to just get them both and you can set them aside you're going to read one on Monday and you're going to read one on Tuesday one Monday evening before you go to sleep the other Tuesday evening before you go to sleep and let your own feeling determine how far you read read until you just don't feel like it anymore and then set it down but note to yourself where in the myths in the stories you you stop. So that Wednesday, take the record of where you began in Daniel and where you stopped, and the record of where you began in Sir Green and Green Knight and you stopped, and you know that they both start with the siege of a city, which is an archetypal thing. See if there's any correlation between your, your happenstance stopping places. This is the beginnings of the kind of differential geometry that intelligence gifts us with. We don't have to be helpless in the stupid world because we can only put ourselves together. We can transform that world. Life cooperates with transformation. It's natural to life. She likes that. Those are invitations to dance. She's not going to say no. Life is not a wallflower. Never has been. Ask her to dance. Sorry for the gender. Uh, ask, ask him to dance. He'll dance. Who would like to dance? Keep in mind that everything we're doing for this month is a counter motion to what we did the previous month. So it might be interesting, since you're starting to play with the geometry a little bit, take a tape of today's lecture and compare it to the first lecture in myth. Listen to those two in sequence. Take next week's lecture and listen to it to the second lecture. Or, if you'd like to get really interesting about it, we've already had the 12 lectures on nature and the 12 lectures on ritual. Take the first, the fifth, and the ninth lectures of nature or ritual and play those in a sequence. Listen to one uh, each day for three days in a row. You can sequence it out any way that you like what will start to happen is that you will begin to align because all of this is given directly and it's quite real. You will begin to align your experience in such a way that an inside image will occur in your imagination. The structure of that will be very, very clear. Because even though pairing is the deepest of all, the triad is the first working form that generates a plane. And the plane is the beginnings of a real geometry. The paredness is the beginnings of the dynamic, but the triad, the triangle, is the simplest geometric form. The triad is the beginnings of establishing the plane, P-L-A-N-E. And once one has the plane, then we're on our way. One of the great artists of the 20th century was Kandinsky. And he wrote a little book. He wrote a little tiny book, which was called uh, Concerning the Spiritual and Art. He wrote it for some friends in 1910, and he published it in 1912. And people were 
so confused by the spiritual and art. They said, this is very occult, this is very intellectual. My God, what are you trying to do? So he wrote a sequel to, call, to it called From Point to Line to Plane. And he spelled it out in there. <laughs> and he put a little dot. He said, lo and behold, a point. And then he drew a line. And he said, there it is, a line. And then he sketched out a plane. He said, a plane. Now, if a point, and if you look at your geometry, high school geometry text, it's Euclidean geometry. He lived a long time ago, 2,400 years ago. It's old-fashioned, right? He said, a point is a locus of no dimension. A point is always a vanishing implosion of locus. It's a molecular black hole. But when a point moves, it describes a line. And when a line is visualized accurately, it determines by its vibration a plane. And when you have a plane generated from a locus of no dimension, magically, you have geometric figures that are quite real. Not only is a square real on the plane, but the cube that projects off the plane becomes real also. It becomes real first in the interiorization. But you can project that out and you can make it. You can take clay and you can make it into a nice little square. You can take clay and you can make it into nice little cubes. When you have clay, you can make rock into cubes. And when you have enough cubes of rock, you can make pyramids. You can make whole civilizations. And later on, of course, man learned to make trigonometric functions, lifting geometry off that, and uh, he was able finally to make infinite mathematical planes that revolved in a special rational sequence. And when you strung those together, it turned out to be a mathematically correct trajectory to the moon. It's amazing what one can do. Don't write off intelligence. But be aware that you need to start lining up the qualities that we have. Make alignments. And it's difficult to do it with our material. So just use the lectures. The lectures are without spin enough that you can use them. Oh, easily on this level.